there's an immediate response, which I'd say that's like, do whatever you want, right? Because art is all around us. You can engage in it in whichever way. It's really, I think mm -hmm. art is a lot about like having conversations with people also. It's about finding the beauty in like everyday life. We don't really have to be born with art skill sets. We, this is something that we just develop. People always ask me that, where, where did you learn everything? Like uh, it's it's mostly the artistic sensibilities that are, that have helped me and mm, like none of the three other options. I definitely think that you do not need to be born with a skill set, and neither do you need to go to art school. Art is experience, so it's more about how you understand or experience a space or any form of art. I would think none of that because firstly. We all choose what we want to be by the actions that we take. I know some people uh, say that they're born artists, but I think that it's more of a proclivity that one takes advantage of. Depends on what stimulates you. Because again, art is such a large encompassing term that it's not just someone with a canvas and a paintbrush. To someone with a very technical background, robotics could be a great art form because you manifest, create creations uh, to be able to do things with robots and that is art. Practice the art because simply I really want to. <laughs>something that people believe in which might be true or might be false when i think of a myth i i usually think uh, about it being the story of some person whether they're real or not like some kind of like it's presented in a kind of like historical manner it's usually about people okay i'll just put it in one word it's magical to me it's still it has a mystery to it and it has a magic to it for me the myth seems to be of godlike proportions and and I'm quite sure that that may not be the correct definition but to me when I first think of myth I think of the Greek gods. When it comes to myth I think I would say that it's definitely related to time. Um, when I think about fables I um, I used to love reading like Aesop's fables as a kid so I usually think of I guess like lesson based stories like it's a like inventive way of teaching kids like lessons like everyday lessons. Fable is something related to um, I would say imagination. A fable is something uh, something you connect with Maybe you heard in your childhood, but still it's very prevalent in today's society. You might be able to connect. When I think of uh, fables, I think of Hansel and Gretel and things that happen on our planet with stories. I guess like folktale kind of, it makes me think more about, um, I guess, the process in which like we tell stories. To me, uh, folktale uh, seems a little tribal to me. Uh, with that small tribes. The folklore is for me, my grandma. <laughs> That's my reminder. <laughs> I, I, I don't know about picking one, but I think uh, because I've been so immersed in the experience of Kathak, which is a dance mm -hmm. form, a mm -hmm. lot of it to me relates around the stories of Radha and Krishna. The relationship that Krishna and Radha shared, it was mm -hmm. a great way for me to engage in art in terms of understanding mm -hmm. this relationship. The story of uh, Lord Krishna, the way the story was put, like he he killed a seven-headed snake, he killed mm -hmm. many monsters when he was a little kid. Something, something that I thought was always an important lesson is like Hiranyakashap. Um, mm -hmm. the myth of Hiranyakashap. I think the like idea of like always like remembering to be humble and like remembering that while you might like you don't need everything I guess right uh, like like having that balance where like you should definitely like believe in yourself but then there's uh, like a very negative way that could go which can lead to like a lot of jealousy and you using your power incorrectly so I guess that's that's a myth I really like because I think it has a good lesson about like maintaining that balance I think Mahabharata is my favorite uh, mythological story because uh, there are varied characters to it I think there are very different layers to it, so 
it's different each time you read it. So that makes it interesting. Trauma tends to be my favorite because, and as cliche as it sounds, it really is uh, good over evil for the most part. And uh, with all the chariots and with all the stories that you have and every character having its own background story. It's Bhima for me from Mahabharata. I think my favorite mythological character should be, would be Medusa. One is uh, Tethnus. I've always loved Ganesha since I was a kid, so I gotta stick with that. So I think I will uh, take Krishna. I loved this book by Ruskin Bond called The Room on the Roof. I really felt quite at one with the protagonist, Rusty. He uh, spent a lot of time with people around him who were older, who came from different backgrounds. And I always thought, uh, I felt a little bit like him growing up. I love the spirit of Calvin and Hobbes. Um, it's that like childlike joy and like finding the little like special moments in life, you know. Maybe I'll, I'll stick to the character Bhima because I think I connect with vulnerability a lot. Edward from Twilight, the Enigma. It's it's really it's really attractive. I genuinely, really deeply dislike gossip only because I've been on the other side of that, and I've been mm -hmm. so like hurt by it. Like I've I've seen the effects of it on myself and people I really love. Is it an art form? I think yes. I think it's the way with which you can weigh information. And I think great art is in trying to do that while trying to not make it sound like you're doing that. I really don't like to admit it, but I do gossip. And I, I do enjoy it, really. Like, there, there is a connection with, with the people you gossip with, and it's really fun. You, you, you should know how to tell a story. But is it an art? Yes, it is an art. I think some, uh, I've seen some people who create stories among it and it makes it very interesting. So it's definitely an art. Uh, it is definitely an art. I think more than gossiping, I think it's the art of listening. It's been helpful to guide people through different phases and incidences of their lives and be of some help somewhere. So, uh, it was in 2017 that as a Fulbright Scholar at Indiana University, I embarked on an uh, inquiry project which was to basically create a handbook on using role play for liberation. So basically the uh, tenet of my handbook was that if we were to choose stories from mythology, why mythology? Because mythology offers us the luxury of being objective and subjective at the same time. So to choose mythology and then to perform it. And when I talk about performance, I'm not talking about a professional theater performance, but just to tell that story with the basic requirements of some uh, uh, costumes, some basic props. What it does is when we tell the story of some hero or heroine, we at some point start also attaching our own life's endeavors and struggles and strives along with these heroes. Now that is the reason whenever I performed Karna on stage, it always left me with a certain sense of fulfillment, a certain sense of achievement, sometimes melancholy, sometimes a particular, a particular kind of catharsis. Now this is something which mythology affords us. And this particular uh, aspect of using mythology uh, in terms of telling the story to a group of uh, people always helps us to kind of break out of certain uh, anxieties, nervousness and tension which we pile on ourselves due to our issues of uh, possibly feeling uh, low self-esteem or having uh, uh, you know low self-respect. So mythology as a tool to be used as a role play aspect which basically means that you are playing the role of a person who is not you. So it allows you to be objective and by this inspired objective, you are able to somewhere explore and touch 
the endeavors and strives of your own life so let me start by talking about uh, some of the mythological characters that i have explored in the form of uh, theater plays uh, specifically as monologues and uh, the primary uh, character who comes to my mind who has uh, held my interest and love for a very very long time uh, almost since i can remember uh, has been the character the mythological character of karna nahi diya kyon samarthan paap ka us din kiya kyon na koi yogya nishkriti pa raha hu so what uh, i was exploring on stage was uh, was what was the story of karna in the form of an epic narrative almost like poetry and that used to uh, go on for almost one and a half hours so every time i perform the character of karna on on stage it always leaves me with a with a quite an uh, myriad ball of uh, emotions uh, these emotions uh, a uh, range from the sense of uh, feeling uh, exalted glorified it, talk, it it makes me feel liberated it makes me feel at times uh, wanting to scream at the top of my voice about why why things are the way they are so this always uh, led to a question within myself that when we perform on stage specifically monologues and specifically mythological characters what is it about them that leads to a particular sense of liberation what is that embedded in these mythological characters in these narratives in these storytelling uh, in in this storytelling format which makes us feel emancipated liberated allows us to express ourselves uh, uh, more forcefully so this was a quest that i started on and i believed that narratives and storytelling have within them embedded a certain healing prowess i mean in today's time we are looking at acting being taught in institutes uh, there is a particular glorification also associated with learning acting at particular institutes and then the glory of belonging to a particular lineage carrying forward a legacy vis-a-vis theater flowing from one's institute from one's uh, intuition so we are looking at the conundrum of intuition versus institution so what came first we realize that theater as a craft flows from our human cognitive skills and it has the ability to kind of uh, you know bring people of the society together in one singular stream of consciousness Uh, long before we even thought about acting to be studied in a particular format or within set modalities and parameters when we look at the ancient times the agency which was there to pursue arts was absolutely one of freedom it was there for everyone to follow i mean uh, in terms of when we look at cave paintings or the kind of uh, uh, stories which came up the kind of music which was enjoyed and created as we went along all our everyday uh, uh, functions in today's time we see that there is a very special space given to the creation of music art etc so somewhere i uh, question has this agency been taken away from the people you know there are people out there who say oh we cannot act we cannot sing we cannot dance in order to do that you have to be talented you have to be creative you have to be creative so where has that inclination to participate in nature to create somewhere been withdrawn is it because that as humans now we are uh, further into the pursuit of uh, earning a livelihood maintaining our families putting the bread on the table has this taken precedence over our natural skills to commune with each other to create a communion of truth and honesty through the pursuit of theater storytelling and other arts what would happen if this agency once again came into the hands of each and every human being on earth would that lead to a process of self healing of self analysis uh, a process where the analyst and the analyst is both the singular person would that lead to the formation of a much more powerful healthier 
uh, society with mental well-being. I, I, I ponder that storytelling, should that not be a part of the life of each and every person, especially children, because it allows us to enter into a space of imagination, to enhance our cognitive skills, and this agency wherein by which we will be able to regain our control over our lives in terms of who am I, what do I want, and how am I going to get it, rather than following a conformist, stereotypical, uh, cliche model which society offers us and tells us this is the safe path. Let's look at this character of uh, Karna from the Mahabharata. Now Karna, as all of us know, is the wronged hero. When I look at his life, and I'm trying to create a list of the conflicts that Karna undergoes, we look at the fact that he is uh, insulted because he does not belong to a royal family. We look at the fact that he's not able to learn and receive tutelage the way that he wants to. So there is a lot of uh, grief within him. We understand that he has also been uh, cursed by his teacher, that his weapons will not uh, serve him when required. We understand that he has also been uh, involved in the killing of a cow because of which once again he is under a curse that his uh, chariot will fail him during the battle. So when we look at this character, his life is filled with a lot of uh, negatives in the sense that there is a lot of forces which are uh, compiling to be against him, to bring him down at one point. So what does this uh, character do? How does he face each and every one of the turbulence and turmoil in his life? So when I look at this, I look at my own life and try to answer a question. When Karna's teacher rejects him, this situation to me is as if. And then I try to relate either through my imagination or through real experience what the situation to me is like. And then when I make a list of these as ifs based on Karna's life, Karna's life story and mine almost becomes the same. Yes, Karna is a superhero, he is a warrior, and that is the objective aspect about him. But he goes through loss, he goes through rejection, he goes through failure. That makes him a subjective figure. So that's what I was talking about earlier in terms of mythology, affording us both the objective and the subjective view. So a character like Karna, who we know is going to fail in the end because of a particular wrong decision he makes in his life, almost like what the Greeks uh, might call as once hubris, this character is going to go towards his downfall. Knowing it, we wish to indulge and engage in understanding what is the endeavors that this character will do. And when we participate in the endeavors of this character, they become our own endeavors, not just for the uh, performer, but also for the audience who participate in these endeavors. And that creates a beautiful communion, which is affording us this space for self-healing and healing others also. So mythology, uh, for me, I uh, belonging to India, Indian mythology with its richness and its abundance is always available there manifold. But mythology all over the world is so rich that we can draw upon different kinds of stories which have inspired us and we retell these stories. And inside that retelling, we will find a particular piece.